Thank you very much to the conveners for the invitation to give this presentation on 3D computational modeling of lithospheric deformation, asthenospheric flow, and deep metal generation with aspects. So this work has been uh, collaborative with Dr. Sahiri Rajon Arson. He's now a postdoc in New Mexico Tech. Emmanuel Njenju, who's a postdoc in my group. John Nalaboff and Asenath Kwagalakwe. What I'm going to present today has been funded by NSF, particularly through a GeoPRISMS grant and a grant through the EarthCube program. And I'm also using a code that's been developed by the computational modeling, um, the computational infrastructure for geodynamics. So my talk has five parts. I'm gonna go through an introduction to aspect for those of you who are not familiar with it. And then I'll go through these three developments that have evolved in my group um, for lithospheric deformation, asthenospheric flow, and deep melt generation. And then I'll provide some conclusions. So what is ASPECT? Um, it stands for Advanced Solver for Problems in Earth's Convection. It's an NSF CIG code, it's a finite element code. And it's very much a community code that evolves over time. Uh, there's even a hackathon going on right now, I believe, according to all of the GitHub alerts I'm getting in my email. Um, and then the, it builds upon DL2, uh, Trulinos and P-Forest libraries. And it has many applications. So it started for mantle convection on Earth, but it's been applied to Mars and Venus. Um, and then in my group, we've done lithospheric deformation and melt generation. So Aspect solves the Stokes equations for velocity and pressure, particularly the conservation of momentum and conservation of mass. Um, these are for the compressible flow equations, uh, but I'm going to show a couple of examples that actually use the extended Boussinesq approximation. Um, in ASPEC, coupled to um, the Stokes equations is the energy equation to solve for temperature. And you have some options as to which parts of the energy equation you wanna solve for. So if you wanted to do internal heat production, you could turn that on or off. Uh, viscous shear heating, adiabatic compression of, of material, and then latent heat, which is really important if you wanna do Mill generation. So if you want to use Aspect, there's several ways you can get a hold of it. Um, the screenshot to the right is for the actual CIG page. So you can get the release version um, through the CIG page itself. There's also the development version. So if you wanted to extend Aspect yourself for maybe surface processes, you can get that through GitHub. Also all of the other versions as well through GitHub. And then uh, for people who extend aspect, sometimes they will do um, Zenodo or GitHub extensions and, and make their code available through those resources as well. Okay, so lithospheric deformation. I think this will be the most, the component that's most probably applicable to this group um, because we are involving the surface. Um, this is work that was published last year in GRL. And we have made the code open access through Zenodo by linking it with our GitHub repository. So all you have to do if you wanted to use this model is download the zip file, compile aspect, and all the files are available for reproducing this work. And it was led by Dr. Sahiri Rajon Arson. So if you wanted to use this model, um, you need to set up your lithospheric structure. Um, in this particular region, we applied it to East Africa. Um, we decided to use synthetic lithospheric structure, um, which was based on three seismically constrained uh, models. And the specific regions are shown down here at the bottom. You also have the ability to read in crustal structure. So you can use, uh, we used crust 1.0. Um, so you can have a base of the upper crust, a base of the middle crust and a base of the lower crust. So these are all constraints that you can, um, you can use yourself. Then for the temperature condition, um, we used um, a steady state conductive geotherm for the surface down to the base of the lithosphere. Um, we constrained lithospheric thickness and surface heat flow for the key tectonic regions. And shown here on the left is the cratonic domain. In the middle is mobile belts. And then um, the right is the rift domain. So these are showing temperature profiles. So temperature along the x-axis and depth along the y-axis. Um, so these are for the conductive geotherm for three different domains. Below the, temp below the lithosphere, we have the temperature increase adiabatically. So that's an option you can choose yourself. For the density structure, um, for this model, we assume isostatic compensation at 100 kilometers depth. Um, and so we do that by constraining the mantle lithospheric density to be laterally varying so that, we, so that the system is isostatically compensated. So in this figure to the left, 
Um, it's the mantle lithospheric vertically average density. If it's a red color, it's a lower density. If it's a blue color, it's a, it's a higher density. For the crust, we used input from crust 1.0 again. So we had uh, three different layers in the crust density in the upper crust, middle crust, and lower crust. And in, in these figures to the right, um, if it's a red color, it's a lower density. If it's a blue color, it's a higher density. Uh, for the viscosity setup, it's um, realistic to the best of our ability. For the crust, it combines nonlinear quartzite dislocation creep with plastic failure. And so again, this is probably the most relevant for this community because you would be able to couple this with surface processes if you wanted to extend this model. Um, in the mantle lithosphere, we have dislocation creep with plastic failure. And in the sublithospheric mantle, it's, uh, it's composite rheology, so a, a harmonic average of diffusion and dislocation creep. And this is a 3D model of the East African Rift area and surroundings. If it's red, it's a lower viscosity. And you can see that we did capture the asthenosphere in this red region through here. Um, we also imposed some deforming zones based on some work I did in 2018. Okay, so I wanted to show you just a quick example of applying this model to an area and what you could determine. Uh, so we found that lithospheric buoyancy forces, so this is a model that constrains the density of the lithosphere. Um, we did find that it primarily can explain east-west extension across East Africa. And the figure to the left is showing in red modeled velocities and in yellow a kinematic velocities constrained by GPS. Uh, we found that lithospheric buoyancy forces um, are aligned with the kinematic predictions. And then additional forces uh, for regions and deforming zones, which is the figure shown to the right, these are actual GPS velocities in the deforming zones. Those are not well explained by lithospheric buoyancy forces alone. So um, you, we would need to invoke some other process like mantle tractions to explain those. So that was my example for lithospheric deformation. Let me show you um, an extension for a stenospheric flow. Um, this was also published a couple of years ago in 2020 uh, by Dr. Tahiri Rajan Arson. And this one is not on Zenodo, it's actually built into the release code of Aspect. So if you downloaded the development version or the release version, you could, get, you could reproduce this work. So for this initial temperature, uh, the initial temperature conditions, we also impose a lithospheric structure. Um, the figure to the right is a lithospheric model for Madagascar and surroundings from the Fishwick 2010 model. If it's blue, it's thick lithosphere. If it's red, it's a uh, thinner lithosphere. Uh, we impose an approximately approximate conductive geotherm for the lithosphere. So we start at a constant temperature of 273 or 293, whatever you choose at the surface and produce a linear uh, gradient down to the base of the lithosphere. And then below that, it's approximately adiabatic. And so this one was 0.5 Kelvin per kilometer. Um, and then this is a 3D representation of that initial temperature condition for Madagascar and surroundings. Um, the red colors are hotter temperatures and blue are the cooler temperatures. For the viscosity and density setup for this particular model, you, uh, we chose a rigid lid model. So the lithosphere is uh, high viscosity. Uh, and then we had composite rheology for sublithospheric mantle. Um, the figure to the left is a 3D representation of our viscosity model for Madagascar and surroundings. And then on the left, it's showing uh, profiles through the viscosity structure for, um, a, for a thin lithosphere in red and a thick lithosphere in blue. The density is temperature dependent below the lithosphere. So our case study for this particular model extension was for Madagascar. Um, these are figures showing slices through uh, deeper, deep parts of the model. So at 175 kilometers depth and 200 kilometers depth, the one on the right is 200 kilometers. If it's blue, it's showing downwelling. If it's red, it's showing upwelling. And the yellow vectors are showing horizontal velocities. So we, calculated um, asthenospheric flow. And I'm gonna show you a profile through this region um, so you can see what the model looks like um, in depth. And these are for two different time steps. Aspect is time dependent, so you can run it forward in model time. Um, the profile at the top is showing as uh, an instantaneous model. And the profile at the bottom is showing a model after 35 million years showing that this type of convection is, is stable. And what we call this type of convection is lithospheric modulated convection uh, because it's purely constrained by the structure of the lithosphere, the initial temperature condition is. And in the background here, we have temperature 
So blue is the cooler temperatures and the redder colors are hotter temperatures. So for this particular project, I can't go into all the details, but I'm more than happy to discuss it after the talk. Um, we did find that lithospheric modulated convection produces, um, produces a flow field. And we also did mantle wind modeling. Um, so we imposed boundary conditions to test different flow fields. Um, and then we predicted shear wave splitting parameters and found that they had an asthenospheric source in Madagascar and they could be produced by lithospheric modulated convection. And then finally, by using the composite rheology, we found that dislocation creep extends into the upper asthenosphere beneath continental regions, particularly in Madagascar. So this map here is showing the ratio of dislocation creep to diffusion creep. And so if it's red, it's dislocation creep. If it's blue, it's diffusion creep. Okay, so my last example is deep melt generation, which may or may not be as relevant for this community, but I hope that maybe you, know, you could extend this. It may be useful for you at some point. So this one's also published last year in JGR and it's available through Zenodo open access. So the initial temperature setup is very similar to the one I just showed you. We use a lithospheric structure and this one in particular, uh, we applied it to the Malawi Rift in East Africa. Um, we have an approximate conductive geotherm from the surface to the base of the lithosphere and then adiabatic geotherm, an adiabatic increase in temperature below the lithosphere. This is a 3D representation of, um, of the Malawi Rift region uh, of our initial temperature condition. Blue is a cooler temperature and red is hotter temperature. For our viscosity, we also impose the rigid lid assumption, uh, but someone could easily couple this to our lithospheric deformation model and have it deforming as well. Um, and then below the lithosphere, we did the harmonic average of dislocation creep and diffusion creep for a composite rheology system. Um, and then this is a 3D representation of our viscosity structure. The blue is showing the rigid lid um, model. And then below that, we have laterally varying viscosity. So what's truly different about this model than the previous one I just showed you for asthenospheric flow is how we calculate density and how we allow for melt generation. So the lithospheric density is fixed, but below the lithosphere, it is pressure and temperature dependent and we can calculate density for melt and solid regions. And then on the right, we have the melt fraction equation. So we're able to determine and differentiate if the, if the temperature crosses the solidus or not, and if it crosses the liquidus or not. And so whether the part of the model actually meets the conditions for melting. So again, we applied this to the Malawi Rift. The figure to the left is showing um, in the white dashed lines, that's, that's the outline of the Malawi Rift. And then in the northern part is a place where we had melt generation, which is very close to the Rungwe volcanic province. And then the figures to the right are a profile through this region um, at different time steps. And then there's some insets that highlight um, where we found melt generation uh, very near the Rungwe volcanic province. Um, so some key conclusions from this particular paper are the lithospheric modulated convection does produce uh, melt beneath the Rungwe volcanic province. Um, it could entrain plume, ma plume material. And this work suggests that a plume is necessary beneath the Rungwe volcanic province to produce these conditions for melt. So again, I can't go into the details, but I'm more than happy to discuss this work afterwards. So finally, to summarize, I've shown you three developments in aspect, um, some, some extensions to do lithospheric deformation, asthenospheric flow, and deep melt generation. I showed you a couple of examples about the East African Rift, where lithospheric buoyancy forces can be used to explain rigid plate motions. Um, we showed, I showed you a Madagascar example where dislocation creep extends into the upper asthenosphere, and then the Malawi Rift, where we found lithospheric control and melt generation uh, beneath the Rungwe volcanic province. So all of these are available open access through Zenodo or within the development code of aspects, and I'm happy to take any questions at this point. Thank you. Actually, two questions, if you don't mind. Um, 
one one technical and one sort of bigger picture. The, the technical one is just how long do these integrations usually take when you run, I guess you run them on an HPC. The more conceptual one is, um, can you tell us a little bit more about the asthenospheric flow examples and how they impact the surface? It looks like you were seeing millimeter to two millimeter a year vertical rates plus and minus. And over what kind of spatial length scale does that usually happen? Mm -hmm. So for the technical question, it varies depending on how long we're running the model and model time. Uh, some of them can take up to a week, some of them just a day. So that's the kind of the range. And yes, they are on high performance computing machines. Um, if we're running low resolution models, we can do them in an hour or so, you know, if we're just testing out or doing quick experiments. Uh, for the uh, general question, uh, so the asthenospheric flow example that I showed, it's lithospheric modulated convection, and it is pretty slow. It's kind of like secondary convection of the mantle right below the lithosphere. Um, and we've seen rates up to like three centimeters per year. Yeah. Brad, did you have a question too? So I, I have two as well. And one is uh, a very outside the field question. I think I remember what dislocation creep is, but could you tell us what diffusion creep is? Uh, diffusion creep is usually um, a rheology that's that happens in the deep mantle from the what we what we know about. Um, it's linear and it it's not nonlinear rheology like dislocation creep, but diffusion creep is like um, anyway. It's it's mostly imposed in deep mantle structure, and it's yeah. That's that's going to be my general explanation for that one. What is the mechanism behind that? Um, I think it's. It's not grain boundary sliding. I think it's where at the atomic level, um, you actually have replacement of the atoms. It's actually replacement, not sliding. So. Thank you. You're welcome. And another uh, perhaps dummy question, but mm -hmm. I think I learned something big and new today. You showed that the structure of the lithosphere can induce a stenospheric motion so that uh, stretching and thinning of the lithosphere could cause the upwelling and divergence of flow that could feed back on stretching and thinning of the lithosphere? Is that a, a feedback like it seems like it would be? Well, that what you're describing is like passive upwelling. So yeah, if stretching and thinning of the lithosphere is happening, you can get, uh, you can get upwelling just as a result of the thinning of the lithosphere and the asthenosphere fi uh, filling that space that occurs. But what we're doing is not actually thinning the lithosphere. We keep the lithosphere rigid. So it's it's truly just the temperature variations that it's so mm -hmm. it's thermal convection just just due to the structure of the lithosphere. But would that then tend to cause thinning of the lithosphere and reinforcing the, the process? Yeah, if you allow the lithosphere to deform, yes. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Uh, I already saw one talk before, uh, like one of your talk before, and this was different, but also so good. So thank you. So my question is, um, can we apply this type of models to subduction zones and change like the angle of the subduction zone and see how that chain topographic, like along the lithosphere, like the crustal lithosphere and like change it with the ocean? Like, can we model that too in, in this? Absolutely, yeah. There's a lot of people that use aspect to model subduction. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hello, uh, great talk. Uh, so uh, I want to expand on that question. So dislocation creep or diffusion creep, these are kind of very micro scale processes we observe on, in minerals or on grains. So what all assumptions go when you're extending these concepts to understand more macro scale uh, conviction processes? Uh, I, th I think your question was like, what kind of assumptions go into the rheology essentially? Yeah, so like so we, since, yeah. Yeah, so like we have to make a lot of assumptions about the material parameters. You know, is it dry olivine or is it wet olivine? Is it in the crust, is it dry dislo is it dry quartzite or wet quartzite? So we have to make some some important assumptions about that. 
like we've we've in the past chosen dry olivine for the deep mantle or for the sublithospheric mantle, and that makes convection slower. If we used wet olivine, it would make it faster. So those are some important assumptions we have to make and choices we have to make. And we'll do that based on the tectonic setting. So if we were in a subduction zone setting, it would be more appropriate to use wet olivine. But in the continental rift setting, far from subduction, we, we feel that um, dry olivine is the more appropriate material parameter. 